Our scripture today, it comes from John 20. Um, it's the second portion of this. This is the coming, the resurrection. And the first part of uh, the John 20 is my favorite part of the Bible, um, of all of it. So um, this is also pretty good. But the first part's really great. But the second part, uh, this is the story. Uh, the first part is when Mary Magdalene runs and tells everybody, like, hey, women were the first of the tomb, you're welcome. To also tells the disciples, like, you boys up. But this part is when Thomas has a few things to say. So I'm going to be reading Common English Bible. You can read whatever you want. Um, John 20, 19 through 31. It was still the first day of the week. That evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors, because they were afraid of the religious authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. After he said this, he his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the divine parent sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and received the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they're forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Ooh. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. Probably he's getting groceries because they're all hiding. The other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. He said, listen, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand in his side, I won't believe. After eight days, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands, put your hand here in my side. No more disbelief, believe. Thomas responded, my Lord and my God. Jesus replied, do you believe because you've witnessed me? Happy those who do not witness yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in any scroll. But these, written, these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is Christ, God's child, that believing you will have life in their name. So word of God, for the people of God, thanks be to God. Will you make it a little less hot? Sorry, like just a smidgy. Is this what I want? Possibly. Um, so, Doubting Thomas is the, one of the disciples, and it seems that they get like such a bad rap. For heaven's sakes, we call him Doubting Thomas. But for me, this has never made a lot of sense. Why is it not proof is helpful, Thomas? Why can't it be scientific method, Thomas? Perhaps even a bit gruesome for me, but I get where you're coming from, Thomas. Or likes a good fact check. Thomas, why is it never be acting a fool all the time, Peter? Still can't walk on water, always doubting, Peter. Can't stay awake when literally that's all I've asked of you, Peter. But no, Peter is the one that gets known as whom Jesus is going to supposedly build the church on, and Thomas gets paired with a slightly insulting nickname. I think it's rude. Sure, we witness Jesus gently teaching Thomas here, saying that, Witnessing proof is one thing, but it should not be the uh, basis of our faith. In terms of corrections from Jesus, it's really not all that bad. I mean, did he call Thomas Satan? No, like he did to this one disciple, who you might ask, but did you really need to? Could you not infer that it was perhaps why I can't believe he hasn't caught hands yet, Peter? Poor Thomas. We only know of Thomas from this one moment of doubt, of questioning, and the admonishment and the statement, happy are those who don't witness and believe. Yes, sure, they're sass, Jesus, I get it. And it's a nice sentiment that you're teaching, but I've got some issues. Because without doubt and without questions, we don't really ever learn. We don't grow, and questions loosen the grounds for the roots of our faith to become deeper and allow for the possibility of new growth. Throughout this season of Easter, our sermon series will be exploring the theme, Resurrected Reality. What does the, how does the resurrected reality appear? What does it embody? What does a resurrected reality mean for us in the here and now today? I think one way we witness the resurrected reality is both by asking hard questions. Hello, little rain nuggets and realizing that we might not always get an answer. 
being able to hold those things in balance with the questions we have, along with the realization that we might never have the answers to our questions, it need, at least not in this reality or in this lifetime, is maybe one of the hardest aspects of faith, the tension between the unknown and the unknowable. There are many aspects of our faith that asks us to hold things unresolved, not fully explained. Christianity invites us to hold the idea that Jesus is both fully divine and fully human. It asks us to engage with a Trinitarian divine as creator, redeemer, and sustainer, an idea that isn't even there in scripture. All of these things are deeply complex, and for most of our human understandings and human measurables, not quite fully explainable. That's the difficulty of faith, belief without full understanding, hope without explanation. For me, Thomas embodies all of us at some point, perhaps many, and more often than not, along our faith journey. We've got questions, lots of them, and we don't always get a lot of answers in return. Recently, a person posted on a forum in my hometown. It was like not a bad forum. Um, so, you know, hold that. Um, recently, they posted that they were thinking about church. And I was like, congrats. And wondering if it would answer some of their questions. And I said, mm, um, honestly, no. Um, a good church probably won't answer any of your questions. It should only really ever give you more. There's a profound experience that can come from times of doubt and times of questioning. They can result in new realizations, in a deep settling of self, but just as often it can precipitate journeys of deconstruction and difficult unlearnings. With Thomas, he questions... His questions lead him to a radical and intimate moment with his teacher and friend. And because of this, Jesus was able, or Thomas was able to switch his understanding about who Jesus was and what that meant for Thomas. Jesus goes notably from the name rabbi, teacher, just a few verses earlier, to Lord or, Messi to Lord or Messiah, which is that's what the word means, and God, my Lord and my God. This is perhaps the first time and it, of the resurrection story, and it's for, certainly the first time in John, that the resurrected Jesus is called God by any of his followers. Until now, the resurrected Jesus has only been referred to as Lord slash Messiah slash Christ. That is what the word is in the Greek. Yet Thomas, doubting Thomas, is the one that does the theological work here. He is a disciple that is able to do the work, the labor of the rabbis and the prophets. He does the hermeneutical labor and proclaims not only Christ crucified, Jesus resurrected, Jesus is Lord, but Jesus as divine. So don't be doubting on Thomas. He is doing some good theological unpacking and reimagining. He's got good questions. Thomas gets what it means to live into the tension of a resurrected reality. This resurrected reality does not deny or even avoid questions. The comments and concerns box are in, in fact open. In the midst of the questions and in this quiet of our doubt, Jesus always offers words of comfort. First, peace. Peace be with you. Peace be in you. Peace be yours. In the midst of the doubt and the wondering and the question, may peace be at your heart. The second is that the Spirit of God will be with you in the doubt, in the storms, and throughout all questions. That the Spirit of God is comforter and sustainer. The Spirit of God is there, steadfast and unchanging, unlike the tides of our life. These are the truths that are our portion and our comfort as we go into a resurrected reality a peace that surpasses all understanding, and a guide, a comforter and friend who will be there in the midst, in every season and every change. Today, as we continue to imagine the resurrected reality and what it means for us, I want you to imagine and consider your doubts, to ponder your questions. Do not put them away, for they are actually tender points of grace. They are, not they are not things of shame, but opportunities of wonder. 
and they will lead you on a path of peace. Thanks be to God.